Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dyslexia Life Hacks Show. I'm your host, Matthew Head. And in this episode, I'm glad to welcome back Lee Povey. He's a former professional cyclist competing at youth level and then later on in life at Masters. When he finished his youth career, he transitioned into sales, where he worked his way through the ranks around his own business before realizing that wasn't for him. He then transitioned into coaching, previously athletes and now CEO of founders and startups. He has previously worked for Team USA Cycling as a coach. Lee was on the show back in episode 58, where we talked about him finding out about his dyslexia 50. We got a deep dive into his journey of self-discovery, including a major cycling accident that turned his life around. We go through things like men's group, therapy, and all sorts of other things. So I really recommend you check that out. Lee's back on the podcast because after all that talking of over now, we didn't really talk about much about coaching. So we thought we'd focus today's episode on this. You'll be able to listen to it as a standalone episode, but I do recommend listening to Lee's first episode. As always, I'll post links to things we talk about, including the first episode in the show notes, which is available at dyslexialifehacks.com forward slash podcast. Welcome back on the show, Lee. Hi, Matthew, and thank you for the lovely introduction. That's no problem at all. Um, how have things been since then? I know your uh, legs are a bit sore since last time we spoke. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, me and Matthew have been messaging off where I broke my ankle in 2021. And this this the silliest snowboarding accident you can think of. Okay. And it kept getting misdiagnosed. And um, they kept telling me that I'd rolled my ankle, sprained my ankle, and I knew I'd broken it immediately. I felt the crack. So I have a hole in my left ankle that at some point means I'm going to need ankle surgery to oh, okay. have it replaced. Yeah, the bone won't. Ankles are really weird. They don't heal very well. Um, so this this hole will never heal, which means the cartilage will eventually wear away and then it'll be bone on bone and then I'll have to get a replacement. Oh, blimey. <laughs> I thought when we were messing an email, he'd recently done it. I was, I was expecting to see crutches in the background. <laughs> wow. That's a, that's a long time between, hey, I think I've broken my ankle to yesterday. You definitely have done that. You were right in the first place. <laughs> we, we can, yeah, there's a tangent to go off there about um, <laughs> men not being good at looking after themselves. And how I'm exceptionally good at coping with pain because of a lifelong, uh, you know, uh, world in elite sport. And therefore, I just put up with the pain of it. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. We did talk about that in the first episode, didn't we? How we just mm. grin and bear it. But what I want to come back to really is the cliffhanger we had in the first episode. So let me read it out word for word. We all want to be like, and this is, um, I think I'm saying this, we all want to be liked, but. We do things that stop us being liked. You said you had an answer for why people do that. Yeah. So um, we need to go back a little bit. Yeah, um, sure. First, do a little bit of human psychology and then, and then developmental psychology. So we're all born with certain genetic personality traits. Now, I watched my mum and I, I helped my mum and my auntie foster 100 high-risk kids. So I got to see... You know, I got to see what nurture did. And I thought that was the, the biggest part of it. I thought, you know, what our parents did, how we were looked after was really the biggest determinant for how we turn out. And then the more I've researched it and looked at the actual science of it, we are definitely born with certain genetic personality traits. You know, some people are just born with more intrinsic drive. Some people are born with more curiosity, uh, you know. Some people just have a bigger computer, right? Their brain just processes faster. So we're born with these certain, uh, you know, genetic personality traits. Then we enter our family system and we get a reaction to those personality traits that we're born with. And we then adapt to that reaction. So an example might be, you're a really curious little kid. This was me. I'm asking questions about everything because I want to understand the world from day one. Why, mum? Why, dad? Why is this happening? Why does that happen? How does this work? Why does this do this? And, you know, you might get really lucky and get parents that are very patient with you and explain things and then teach you how to keep learning yourself. Or you might get parents who say, shut up, you're too much. Be quiet. Leave me alone. And then we put on adaptive shields to cope and survive in that situation. Now we get to adulthood, we're not in our family systems anymore, and we might enter a workplace where our curiosity is valued. 
But because of what we've been through as a child, we have these adaptive shields around it and we expect people to not want us to be curious. So we don't ask things or we kind of get weird when people are curious about our curiosity. And it's it's how we let go of the armor and those shields when we get older that really determines how successful you can be in life. So that awareness around them and then how you can let go of them and move past them. Yeah, yeah, it's really fascinating actually because uh, obviously you got a statement of dyslexia at fifty. Where like you talk to lots of dyslexic people, and we all, I think, to a point, adapt to how mainly school and stuff doesn't work for us. So I don't know what the numbers would be, but I imagine there's a lot of armor and shields. And I know certainly for myself that was the case. And <laughs> still trying to lose some of it. Like feels when we dread filling in forms because although I've gone through training courses and extra group stuff and all these various different methods and spoken to a lot of people via interview you still have the same feelings like but i can do this i know i can do this now and i don't do it <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting how how do you sort of shake that kind of stuff off and i think that kind of really talks to it with that kind of shields and stuff and like doing well, things we- we set ourselves up because then we create internal stories So, you know, that curious child that gets told they're too much, well, then they start to believe they're too much. And now you're taking on the identity that you're too much. And if we go back to the statement that you you started with, we all just want to be loved and liked. If you really boil it down to the most simplest thing, humans want to be loved and liked. Um, For a variety of reasons, you know, one of the main reasons is it's an evolutionary adaptation that we have to be liked to be in the community. Because if you aren't liked and valued in your community, you get ostracized in your community. Well, you go back to tribal times, you died. If you weren't in the community, you got left out of the community. You didn't have the safety. You didn't have the food. You didn't have the shelter. The chances were you're going to die. And that's kind of how we feel. You know, you think about teenagers when they fall out with their friends and how dramatic it is to them and the impact on them. So we just want to be loved and liked. And then, you know, as we evolve, we want to be appreciated and we want to be respected and we want to be valued. Still underneath that is this little kid that's like, please love me. And, you know, then it comes to, so these survival shields, most people don't know that they have them. Because unless you've done the work, you're just not aware of it because it's, you developed it at such an early age. It's such an integral part of you. It's, it's very hard to see them without working with somebody like me or a therapist who can show it to you. And without knowing it, we're still, that's the lens that we're looking at the world through. And, you know, as human beings, we tend to look at the world and go, well, everybody else thinks the same as us. No, they don't. So we expect people to behave in certain ways because of the experiences that we've had. And they don't. And then we're confused. And then the other thing is, because we can't see this about ourselves, but other people often can, or at least they can react to it, what we call these things survival mechanisms. And when you're in your survival mechanism, so when your shield is activated, when you feel activated, and the, you know, the popular word right now is triggered, when you feel like that, and you know, that's not always the correct, the correct way to use that. I prefer activated in this instance. When you're activated, the person you're working with or the person you're in communication with or your romantic partner, they tend to get activated too. Now, both of you are working from these survival mechanisms and not being your conscious self. You're working from these deep, I don't like the word wounds, but behavioral mechanisms from childhood. And then you've got two of those going against each other and you're not really, you don't communicate like adults anymore. You're just little children that are desperate to be seen and loved and neither of you can see each other. Yes, yes. So, so that's the, but we do things that stop us being liked, isn't it? As you slide out of, because I've heard a great sort of thing. I oh, wish I could remember the book I read out of. Cool. It's referred to as the protest polka as people are dancing and they're, um, like the idea of the polka dance where everybody's dancing, but it only takes one person to switch out of the child mode into more of an adult mode. And that stops the whole thing. If one person could just ground the, whether it's the argument, the disagreement, or even what is a civilized conversation, but two people are going off, off base, yeah. but it's really hard to see that going on. 
it's very hard if you don't have the knowledge about your own survival mechanism. So, you know, yes. with my coaches, I've named my survival mechanisms and my friends know them and my work colleagues know them. And, you know, my wife knows them and, and she'll say to me, are you being a tyrannical Einstein right now? I'm like, mm, <laughs> there's a good chance I am, love, yes. <laughs> so, you know, it, and, and it brings one, it brings a little bit of lightness and humor yeah. to it. You know, that's yeah. why we kind of name them with some silly names. Uh, and two, it's, that really helped me. You know, when you have a sociopathic, narcissistic father, yeah, you have yeah. to have a pretty big shield. And that shield got me through childhood. I don't need that shield now. I'm a fully capable adult. Most of the relationships I'm in, I'm in relationships with other fully capable adults. I don't need this big suit of armor on me. It just weighs me down. It's exhausting to me. And it can be exhausting to them as well. Yes, yes. So how do you, I've been without, obviously, it's lots of coaching in a long time, but what's, I'm just curious, kind of a beginning sort of flick, I guess, the executive summary of how would you start a spot? You're talking to somebody and you can see them switching into this sort of mode, the shield come up. How yeah, do you start so identifying a, it? But there's a bunch of things here. Um, first, taking ownership for ourselves. So, you know, what I like to get people to do is to start noting when they feel activated. So working with four feelings, fear, joy, anger, and sadness, mm-hmm. note when you're feeling something. And, and how I like to think about feelings is they are data telling us about our experience of the world. You know, when we're younger, especially boys, we get told basically don't have feelings. You know, mm-hmm. don't be afraid, don't be a pussy, don't be a wimp, man up, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, fear is really important because fear is telling us about our experience in the world, and we need that information to make informed decisions. So if you turn that system off, you don't make good decisions. Mm -hmm. And if you ignore that system, you don't make good decisions. So the first thing is just teaching people to get in touch with, what do I feel right now? So we do an exercise where um, we set a random timer during the day. Uh, When the uh, notification comes up on your phone, how are you feeling? You do four box breaths. So that's four uh count for four in hold for four out for four do four of those just to kind of get yourself a little bit in touch with your body and then okay what am i feeling right now see if i can note that down and be in touch with that and that trains you to to make that pathway between what you're feeling um, and what's going on in your experience quicker so that you can start to use that as data as information um and then when we're talking about like getting activated you will tend to be activated by people that have your shadow. So if there's people in the world that just really get to you and piss you off, (laughs) be it celebrities, be it friends, be it somebody you work with, likely to be one of two things. Either you are envious of something that they have that you wish you had, Mm. or they have the shadow that you have, that bit about yourself that you don't like. Okay. Yeah, I hate people telling me what to do. I really (laughs) detest it. Well, guess what my shadow is? Telling people what to do and controlling stuff. So, you know, start to note that tool and just uh, uh, two and just think to yourself, you know, who who is it that kind of activates me? Who is it when I'm around them? There's behaviors that they have that activate me. Mm -hmm. And it's likely to be an insight into your world. As I said, either what you're looking for, that envy of, oh, God, I wish I had that. Or mm, here's that thing that I do have that I don't like about myself, and you're there representing it for me nice and clearly in front of me. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because you do meet people like, oh, what's the appropriate language for this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Samuel Jackson's famous term has come to mind at the minute, but <laughs> and you're like, and like, why does this person annoy me? Like, you know, you pride yourself on not getting irritated by somebody, and you're like, this person just pushes all the buttons. But uh, that is really interesting that maybe it's um, the reflecting behavior I don't like in myself that I'm not aware I don't like in myself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and when you have more awareness around it, what happens is you get more compassionate. You get more compassionate for them and you get more compassionate for yourself. And that's really where the healing starts. It has to start with some compassion and empathy for both yourself yeah. and other people. You you can't really go on your journey without without that. Yeah. And yeah. and then the other thing, and that and this part of this compassion is there's an unrealistic expectation or standard and 
you know, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and YouTube channels, and most of them, the ones that I like, they do a lot of mindset stuff. So this is mm-hmm. how you should be. This is how you, this is the techniques that you should use to be more effective. But they miss this bit. And it doesn't matter how smart you are and how big your technique toolbox is. If you are not aware of your own triggers, your own activation, you just can't do it. So it's why you can watch something and you can go, yes, I should do that. <laughs> and then you walk past the donut shop and you have the donut anyway. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No? So we have to <laughs> be aware of... <laughs> is, yeah, just the one donut. We have to be aware of the, of our activators ourselves. And then when we start to get more kind of consciousness of that, then it's easier to actually use the very powerful mindset and emotional models. But you've got to know who you are first. Mm-hmm. And this is why, you know, this is why what I do with businesses is so effective. Because what tends to happen is... They're super smart people. The people I work with are geniuses on the whole. I I work with the smartest people. They're startup founders and executives doing really crazy, exciting things. It's not that I need to be smarter than them. It's not that I'm trying to teach them how to understand their business better. I'm teaching them how to understand themselves better. And I'm helping them uncover that so that their stuff doesn't get in the way so they can be the most effective version of themselves. And you'll get consultants come in and say, right, you should be doing this. And then the smartest people can't do the thing that consultant says because their baggage is getting in the way. The way that they relate to people and themselves is getting in the way. You know, I've worked with startup founders who hired their friends because they needed to be loved, right? So they hired their friends, but their friends couldn't do the roles that they were hiring them for. Even though they're all wonderful people, you know, and, and, and smart people in their right, they weren't in the right roles and or the company outgrew them. And this person struggled to then let go of those people because they got something from those people being there and supporting them. So we worked a lot on that person supporting themselves and finding that support outside of the business and valuing themselves like that. So they didn't need it in the business because it was getting in the way. Um, yes. One of the smartest people I've ever worked with. So it's not it's not cognitive, um, you know, it's not the size of the computer you're working with here. It's what are the patterns that you need to uncover and let go of. And the other thing, you know, the other mistake that people make with a lot of this, they look at the very highly successful people and they think it's easy for them. One, it's not. And two, they think that these people never have bad moments and they never react and they never get activated. And I can tell you that is so far from the truth. Mm-hmm. What they're good at doing is recognizing it and moving out of it. So there's a model called above and below the line by the conscious leadership group. And I really like it. Below the line is our reactive, animalistic, tribal, instinctual, initial reaction to any situation, whatever that might be. You know, if somebody put in a comment you don't like on your on your podcast, you know, YouTube channel, whatever, right? Mm. And everybody reacts to that stuff. It might be for a second, it might be for a week, but everybody has some kind of reaction because that's what that's what being a human being is. Yeah. And then it's like, what do you do next? Yeah. And when you know yourself, you understand why you're reacting, what that is triggering in you, you accept it and you say, okay, how would I like to choose to be instead? You know, so an example, you're driving down the road, somebody cuts you up. How do you typically react, Matthew? Um, I try to be calm. Um, is It tends to be my reaction because I'd remind myself that yeah, they've cut me up and I've lost so many seconds worth this drive, but they're having a bad day to do that in the first place. <laughs> Which is wonderful. Go back a stage before we get to that, though. What's your typical immediate reaction? Mm. Normally. But normally a bit of a, ah, <laughs> because I've had to break and do something initially, and then it's the catch okay. afterwards. <laughs> and what do you think is the emotion that you're experiencing in that moment? Mm, out of the four. Well, I'd be angry initially. Okay. Um, I'm going to offer something else. It was probably fear first. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's what happens in these situations. So somebody cuts you up. The first thing is, for a split second, you're afraid. Oh, we mm-hmm. could have a crash. Or I might die. Right? Your yes. brain is doing that very, very quickly. 
And then a lot of us, especially men, move past fear very quickly because we don't like fear. It's a very uncomfortable place for us to be in fear. Yeah. Don't like it, been told we should avoid it, been told it's not good, it's not attractive to be afraid as a man. Weakness. So we tend to move. Yeah. Exactly. So we tend to move past it pretty quickly. And then what protects us from it is anger. Anger mm. is a very protective emotion. Often when people are sad, they'll get angry because it's a very protective emotion. Uh, you know, the angriest people are often the, the saddest and the loneliest. So we move past that fear, and now we're angry, and now it's got to be about them. It's like, you know, you a-hole, why did you do that to me? <laughs> As though that person is deliberately doing it to you. You know, they've yeah. gone, oh, this person here, <laughs> I need to ruin his day. Yeah. And I love what you said of, like, okay, then I try to, and this is what this model is, have your reaction. It's okay to be afraid when somebody trust to drive into you <laughs> yeah, yeah. or is not aware that you're there yeah. then it's okay to be angry god i nearly got hurt right mm -hmm. okay and then then get curious oh i wonder what happened did they just not see me are they late for a hospital appointment you know they have they just split up with their romantic partner we have no idea what's going on for that person and why that happened mm -hmm. and it can be so many different things yeah, our little animal instinct inside is, oh, they did that to me. Yes, yeah. Very little in the world is happening to you. <laughs> you might be feeling the byproduct of something that's going on, but the chances are it's not actually happening to you. You know, the chances are that that person has deliberately thought, that guy there, I want to ruin his day, is pretty <laughs> slim. Yes, What's it? We're, we're, we all think the main character in our own personal <laughs> story, but we can't all be main characters walking around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can think we are. We will yeah. be wrong. <laughs> we'll be very, very wrong. Yeah. And as, as if we're that important in everybody else's world, even complete and utter strangers who, yeah, cut us up in a car or whatever. <laughs> yes. Yes. The, um, I have been in cars and drivers where it's all the hand gesturing and the headlight flashing back and forth. And that, that seems like not a productive way to finish that. <laughs> no, and, and that's a good segue to, you know, you asked me at the beginning, what do we do about this? Mm. So, you know, another way to look at this is the difference between content and context. And this is especially when we're in relationship with people. And when I was working through this myself, I, I, for some reason, maybe the dyslexia, I really struggled to get this and understand what these words mean. So I'm going to try to make this as simple as I can. Content is what we are talking about. So me and you are having a conversation. Um, we arrange to meet for dinner. I get there at 6 o'clock. We've arranged 6 o'clock. You turn up at 6.15. And I'm annoyed with you. And I'm like, hey, I thought we were meeting at 6 o'clock. And you're like, well, I'm only 15 minutes late. I'm like, you're 15 minutes late. And you're like, oh, it's not a big deal, buddy. It's only 15 minutes. That's the content. We're talking about the content. However, behind that is a whole nother level of stuff going on that we are not verbalizing. That's the context. So when you were saying earlier about when you've got two people or a group of people that are activated, how do you step out of that? It's thinking, what's the context here that I'm missing? So. What would you imagine my context to be if I'm annoyed that you're late? I would, my gut feeling would be not respecting your time and maybe you also have things to do. Yeah. And how does it make you feel when somebody doesn't respect your time? But that they, well, if somebody doesn't respect their time, then they believe they're somehow more important than what's going on. And, and then. What does that make you in relation? Well, inferior, I guess, is ultimately where we're going. <laughs> and then if we go another level deeper, what might yeah. that mean to somebody if you feel less important or inferior to somebody else? Oh. <laughs> Testing me now. <laughs> <laughs> I have all the smart answers till we get too deep. <laughs> well, I guess inferior, then that makes them feel less. Maybe it brings up things that they when they felt like that before, and that's a whole other kind of can of worms that comes up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, what do you feel when you're in fear of something else? Just small and less, um, yeah. you know, not understood, I guess. Yeah. 
And, you know, back to the original where we were starting with this of just not being liked. Yes, of course. Right? Yeah. We want to be liked and we want to be loved. And if somebody else in our perception mm. puts their own needs as higher than us, you know, many people will take from that, oh, you don't like me as much as I thought you did, or you don't love me as much as I thought you did, or you don't love me at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's just because somebody was 15 minutes late. And all of this is going on in the background, in our subconscious, and we're not often aware of it. So what we do is we spend 30 minutes arguing about 15 minutes in time. Mm -hmm. Like, you're late. I wasn't that late. You know, traffic was busy. Well, I don't care. You should be here on time. And we're just arguing about that. But what we're missing is, I just need you to say, I'm sorry. I do love you, buddy. My bad. Yeah. 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 You'll be amazed how often when you see that context, when you stop and you think, like, what's the context? Yeah. And you see this in romantic relationships and business relationships, which can be very similar to romantic relationships. <laughs> really? <laughs> The same dynamics are going on. Yeah. And, you know, people are arguing about ideas or people are arguing about stuff and they just want to feel valued. You know, a lot of the work I'm doing, people just want to feel valued. They don't even necessarily want to win the argument about whether their idea is right or not. They just want to feel like they're heard yeah. and that people value them. And from that, that base instinct of, oh, I am, I'm an okay human being, right? I'm mm. likable. I'm lovable. I'm not worthless. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting, isn't it? How from two friends that meet at dinner at different times to, you know, I bet you've coached world-class athletes that that's the root cause of some of their performance maybe going on off or not quite where it wants to be to these very genius level CEOs and startup companies who have got the next million pound idea. And it's it doesn't matter, does it? It, it cuts across all kind of lines, doesn't it? And this stuff is very um, separated from your cognitive ability. You know, yes. your ability to look at a complex problem and come up with an answer, a solution for it, or to create and to come up with, you know, new ways to do things. It's different from understanding why you behave the way you do. Yeah. And, you know, often people can be geniuses in one level, and not in this level. And it's going to affect how, they, how they're how they able to work. And we can even see it in, you know, the highest performers. Um, you know, we've got some of the richest people in the world that have made great money as engineers or in engineering companies. And then they do something different and are abjectly failing at that <laughs> yes. because they think it's the same. And it's not. Um, you know, and, and we often, I think, as society, we don't understand intelligence. Intelligence has many facets to it. Mm. And, you know, as leaders, we want to be making sure that we make the people around us feel better about themselves and seen and understood because then they will perform at their best. So, you know, this crosses over to my work with elite sports coaches. Yeah. This old model of the authoritarian leader and coach that shouts at people, you know, stands on the sidelines of the football pitch and shouts, you're not doing it well enough. Every study shows that actually that human beings don't react very well to that. No, no, no. And imagine you end up self-selecting for the odd ones that do. You select for people that have a lot of resilience because they probably came from a childhood system that that was prevalent in. So they have resistance to it, right? They, their shield is such that it just kind of washes off them um, and, and they kind of ignore it. But then you're, you know, the way I look at leadership is I should be able to morph myself and adapt myself as a leader to be able to inspire and lead anyone. And this old thing that used to have, or I'm a, this type of leader, right? This is, this is my leadership style. Whenever anybody starts talking to me about this is my leadership style, I immediately think, well, then you're an immature leader because ultimately you should get to the point where there is no style. You are able to fully adapt yourself to whoever you're leading to get the best out of them. So you have such a large toolkit and such a large personal awareness and awareness of other human beings and how they relate that you know what buttons to press to get the most out of them. And ultimately, to make them feel the best about themselves, so that they feel armoured up to go into the world in a positive way rather than a negative way. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Like you're saying, go back to these the old school coaches where they just shout and holler and stuff. But I don't know how often you see that. Well, I imagine you still see it quite a lot nowadays. Um, <laughs> any small sports team on a Sunday morning <laughs> will have a few people on the sidelines yelling like that. I Look at any kid's sport. You yeah. know, I was talking to somebody the other day and uh 12 year old son playing baseball and they were like yeah the coach was really reaming them because they didn't play very well <laughs> like the 12 years old you know what i want a 12 year old to take from this how to get on with their teammates how to yeah. communicate with their teammates how yeah. to enjoy it um most junior world champions so you know a study done on olympic athletes most junior world champions i can't remember the exact number but 70 75 percent maybe higher those that win a junior world championship so most junior world championships are 15 to 18 years old mm. don't go on to win the olympics oh, many really? don't go on to even compete in the olympics and it's not because they're not physically gifted enough it's no. because they're burnt out it's because they you know they're trained too seriously too young uh, and what it also shows you is you don't need to be world class at 15 to 18 to go on and win the olympics because most olympic champions aren't they might not even be doing the sport. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because it does feel like um, the world of sport, uh, I guess, gla glamorizes the people who like, hey, we picked them up at eight and by 21, they're world class and they're winning races or championships or whatever. And, and there is there is value to taking time to build an athlete and some yeah. sports especially the more technical sports they take time to learn that technique so if you're looking at things like tennis and golf it takes it takes time and yeah. doing that when you're younger can be a benefit but you don't necessarily need to be doing it at the highest level yes. to then go on and be more successful as an adult and it definitely doesn't need to be your you know how seriously you take care is much less important than are you doing the fundamentals well. Mm. If you're doing the fundamentals well, match the seriousness to that young athlete's level of maturity. And, you know, having worked with world-class young athletes and, 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 you know, coached junior world champions, you get the kids that need to be pushed and you get the kids that need to be slowed down. Most of my junior yes. champions need to be slowed down. I'm like, I'm slowing their development down because I know it doesn't need to be rushed. Because they're like, give me more, coach. Give me more. Do more training. Like, I can take it. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of coaches go with that because it feeds yeah. their ego because these kids yeah. are doing exceptionally well. The coach looks good. Instead of, is this right for this young person's long-term athletic development? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the same as, you know, leadership in, in business. You should always be thinking, what do I need to be doing today to be the best version of myself in the future, not what is the quickest thing for me to do right today? Everybody looks at people who are successful and goes, oh, my God, it came easy to them, or like it just seemed to happen overnight. And we miss all the failures, and we miss the years of doing things before they got to the successful stage. Mm. Yes, yeah. Yeah, we do. We we see the tip of the iceberg, which is all the success, not the thousands upon millions of hours that go into that kind of stuff. Richard Branson is fascinating to follow for that. He's had as many failures as he's had successes. Yes. It yeah. just so happens his successes have won big. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, he's bet the farm and it's come back. But there's other, yeah. Virgin, what was it? Virgin Air Airways worked really well and then Virgin Cola failed abysmally. <laughs> well, he, the first few businesses he did failed. He went yeah. bankrupt yeah. multiple times. But what he did was he was persistent. And we undervalue persistency. We confuse it with hard work. You know, working 18 hours a week isn't necessarily going to make you rich. Some of the hardest working people I know are some of the worst paid. So it's not about <laughs> yeah. hard work. You know, we confuse that. It's about doing things consistently well for long periods of time. Yeah. Eventually, it tends to pay off. Yes, yes, yes. It does, doesn't it? It's worth. Yeah, you sort of get created through the pits of despair and then suddenly things take off. And, yeah, yeah. Keep, and that's keep what tends to happen. Going. We tend to get to a low point where we're like, this isn't going to work. And the people that have either learned more resilience or naturally had, you know, we're going back to that genetic personality trait. Some people are born with more resilience. 
those people that can see that tougher period through tend to get to the other side. And now it's like, okay, now everything that's happened there has taught me how to do this better. Now, suddenly I'm building some traction. Yes, definitely. Now, I want to sort of kind of, obviously we spoke last time about how you got into coaching and the sort of transition to that when you started training well, training as a master level and people were listening to you and you, hey, but you've clearly done a lot of research into the psychology of it and people who tuned in and listened to get the toolbox have probably been like, ah, this is slightly different than it. Like, it's not do A, do B, do C, crack on, which can be very practical and tactical that people sort of can't enjoy. But what got you curious in that in the first place? And how did you realize that that would, would be a great thing to leverage to get the most out of your athletes probably at the time and then your CEOs and founders later on in, in coaching career? Um, I think my particular personality trait, my genetic personality trait, I'm very high in curiosity mm. and I'm very high in perception. So yeah. add those together, and it means I'm very curious, and I also can see a lot of what is going on that, that other people can't necessarily see. So you know, we're talking about those survival mechanisms, those behaviors that other people miss. They always just seem blindingly obvious to me. I didn't know necessarily what to do with them and how to understand them, but I would see stuff about people's behaviours. Yeah. And how it kind of panned out for me as a kid was I loved stuff like Lego and Meccano. I wanted to build things and take things apart. And then I got a bit bored with that, and then it, <laughs> and then it turned more to physiology. How does the human body work? That's how I got into sport because, you know, I was really interested in sport, right? How do I train differently for my compatriots to be better than them? And, you know, in all of this, you always find so much dogma. You know, in the world mm-hmm. of sport, there's so much dogma about how you should train. And I would just be that one person going, why? <laughs> but why? But I mean, why? That's literally my life is summed up as, but why? <laughs> and I'm questioning it. And yeah. I'd be in these meetings and I'd be with other coaches and i said, why do you do that? And they'd be like, well, that's the way we've always done it. I'm like, okay, good. But for what reason are we doing that? Like, for... What outcome are we doing this? And then they couldn't explain it. And I'm like, oh, they don't really understand why they're doing it. They're just doing it because that's the way they've done it. I want to understand why. What mechanism is this training? Why do I want to train that mechanism? Why do I want to put 10 hours a week doing this instead of three hours a week doing this? And the more I learned about that, the more I realized how much more there was to learn. What I did notice at the same time was there was lots of coaches with different training protocols. Yet their athletes were ending up at fairly similar results. And it also made me realize, you know, what is the value of the emotional component to this? Why do some people win more than other people when genetically they're pretty similar? If you took them to a lab and you took, you know, the 10 top people in pretty much any discipline, they're going to be fairly similar in the lab. So why does one person tend to win more than the other people? And it's something about their emotional makeup and how they're looking at sport and competing. You know, we've all seen those people that are better on race day and those people that are better in training. Yes. I was typically not great in training, better in race day. Yeah. And I had phases with that when I was younger and I had less fear, fantastic on race day. Loved it. Then... There was a period before I broke my shoulder where the winning mattered too much to me. And then I put too much pressure on myself and I started to get worse on race day than training. And then coming through that experience of breaking my shoulder and kind of realizing the sport is a is a is a privilege, not a right, and that I should really enjoy it and I need to enjoy the process much more than the actual outcome. Then race day got fun again. <laughs> it was like I'm here, I'm in great shape. I just want to enjoy it. And if I win, I win. If I don't win, well, as long as I've done my best and I execute really well, I'll be just as happy. I took all of the pressure off. And then suddenly race day was fun again. And guess what? My performance went up hugely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's such a large mental, emotional component. And I, towards the end of my sports coaching career, that was really what I loved. That was the stuff that was fascinating me. That was the things I was reading books about. I was listening to podcasts about how do we help people to put it as succinctly as possible, get out of their own bloody way so that they can be the best version of themselves. 
<laughs> yes, yes. <clears throat> and that's what led me to this stuff about this, you know, kind of personality traits and then these mechanisms and shields that we put on because that's the stuff that gets in the way. Yeah. You know, we're all born as pretty capable little children and then, you know, life messes with us. It does. And, you know, there's quotes around this. There's a David Bowie quote that, because I'm dyslexic, I'm not going to be able to remember very well. Um, but basically, the you know, the, the the crux of it is we're all trying to get back to that authentic kid. And, and that's the best version of ourselves. And that's what I love doing in this world is helping people move past the stuff that they've they put on themselves. And, you know, you literally physically see it. When they start to take these shields off, their shoulders lift. They have more energy because it's exhausting. Yeah, yeah. Meeting the world in this way when the world doesn't meet you back. Yeah, 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 definitely. And it's, I always think of mental capacity is this finite resource that you've only got so much of it. Uh, if you're taking a percentage of that to do, to keep this going, the shields up, then you free that bit of mental capacity up and it must feel like the world is lighter and you can just get on with things. Now, Interestingly, we were talking as we were warming up to this. Uh, one of the things you said was unique about your coaching is you don't just talk to the founder of the CEO, so you have the one-to-one. You also talk to the executive team and the whole team around them. I mean, it seems, when you said it, well, that sounds quite obvious, but clearly it's not the normal model. <laughs> so can you talk to them more how that works in terms of all this emotional stuff you've been talking about and how... It's all to do with, the, I guess, with the interconnectivity of the whole team and how they work together and how they're bouncing off each other in ways they don't realize they are. Yeah, that's, that's a great way of describing it. Um, what I seem to luckily be reasonably gifted at, or just for whatever reason, this is the way my brain works, I am pretty good at not leaking people's information. So I can work with people one to one and then take those same people and work with them in a group without sharing that private information. Ah, oh, yes. It's quite useful. <laughs> and what instead, yeah, and instead just kind of let them figure it out with my moderation. And, you know, when we do this work and people kind of establish these names for these survival shields that they've put on, they start sharing it with each other. Ah, cool. And then, like, the light bulbs go off. And then, the, you know, going back to this compassion and empathy and love that's what I see a lot. I mean, as I've got older, I realize my job is just to bring love into the world, <laughs> which sounds so wooey for a <laughs> former sports scientist. You know, I was a boxer as a teenager, track sprint cyclist, chasing motorbikes at 50 mile an hour. And, you know, I'm not wooey. This is all based in science, but this just goes back to that. We're all little kids that want to be loved. Yeah, And, you know, if you want something, well, then you also have to bring it into the world yourself. So whatever it is that you want, you're much more likely to get it if you display that yourself because you're going to invite that in from other people. So it's just teaching people to be a lot kinder to themselves. And then when they're kinder to themselves, they understand themselves, have compassion for themselves, they're a lot kinder to each other. So we have these meetings where people are getting way more vulnerable than they were typically used to. And it doesn't, you know, this isn't some kind of, oh, here are all of my triggers that you have to be aware of. Yeah. It's actually the opposite of that. It's like, okay. here's all my triggers, and I'm going to take responsibility for them. Ah. And I'm yes. not asking you to necessarily change your behavior. What I'm saying is, here's what activates me, and I'll know when I'm in activation, and I'm going to take responsibility for doing something about that. And that might be sharing, hey, when you uh, say this, this is how I feel. So you're communicating with somebody else what you need from them. But what you're not doing is telling somebody else how they have to be for you to be okay. You are taking responsibility for you and your safety and what makes you okay. And we've got, you know, there's there's a, there's a movement in the world now that, you know, I should never be triggered. So I should police the world in such a way that nobody ever says anything that upsets me. Well, you're not going to be very successful if that's your outlook on life because there's always going to be things that are going to upset you. There's always going to be things that are going to disappoint you or anger you. All you can ever control is yourself and your reaction to them. And there is so much power in that. You know, the light bulb going off when people realize 
we are giving our power away to other people. When you let people activate you, you're giving your power away to them. And then when we can have these conversations in groups, um, you know, you just feel this high level of camaraderie and people want to be better for each other and they want to they want to see the best in others. So instead of looking at each other and going, oh, I can see where you're messing up, or I can see where you're weak, they still have that high level of accountability with each other. There's no high-performing group I've ever worked with that won't say to somebody, hey, you're letting us down right now and this is why, this is what we need from you. In fact, that actually goes up because there's a trust that that comes from a place of love. It's like, oh, they want me to be the best version of myself so that I can support this group the best, not they're looking for ways to knock me down because they are insecure themselves. And that shift is unbelievable because you will let you will let people say unbelievably direct things to you if you think it's coming from a place of service to you. And I know this because I do this as a coach. I say things to people or I reflect things to people that are really painful, knowing that they might fire me because of that and knowing that that comes from a place of love. I am not trying to be smarter than them. I'm not trying to make them feel small, as we said earlier. Quite the opposite. I'm saying, here's this thing that's getting in your way. Do you want to address it or do you want this thing to keep getting in the way for the rest of your life? Because you're telling me you want to do this, whatever it is, you know, fulfillment, money, uh, growth, like dominating the world, whatever. I, I don't care what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the people that work with me tend to be impact driven and they tend to be very aware of like fulfillment. So they might be wealthy and they might be interested in being financially secure. But usually there's another level to it where they actually want to do something positive for the world. That's the people that tend to get attracted to me. And if you are more aware of yourself and what triggers you and you and you get to that point where you can take responsibility and you can put yourself in situations that might be activating and triggering and still feel like I'm going to be okay. I'll figure this out. I'll ask for the support I need. That makes you an incredibly useful human being. Like you can yeah. achieve a lot because other people's stuff doesn't get in your way anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And more importantly, your stuff doesn't get in the way. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's what it all boils down to. Like, is my stuff getting in the way of me being the best version of myself? Yes. Yeah. And then you've got a load of people for, for this hypothetical executive team example that are all pulling to be the best version of themselves, which must just pull the company up all the time. And not just that, they are relying on each other to support them being the best versions of themselves and say whatever it takes to do that. And again, we're very clear, this isn't, you know, this isn't beating each other up, but this is just very direct. Here's what I see going on right now. How could we do this better? Yeah. Yeah. Not, and especially we get this a lot here in in America where people are just like, oh, you're doing so well, you're really great, because nobody wants to offend everyone. You know, I do workshops on giving feedback. And Uh, invariably what happens when I do these workshops Most people say they would like more direct feedback. Most people are unwilling to give direct feedback. So everybody's like, oh, I just wish people would be honest with me. Yeah, they will not be honest with somebody else. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And guess what? It doesn't work like that. No. You have to be prepared to do what you wish for from other people. And especially as leaders, you've got to role model it. You've got to role model what clear loving direct feedback looks like and and there's a there's a good model to that that i've developed that makes it much easier to do that as well that kind of takes the fear away for people yes yes it's interesting isn't it yeah we want straight honest feedback but not being you've got to be able to give it out if you want it to come in (laughs) yeah and you've got to be eager to find it as well you've got to be saying to people give me direct feedback what is it that i'm missing don't pull your punches. Tell me what it is. Yeah, yeah. What are my blind spots? Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. And um, now it's fascinating, isn't it? Just uh, because you, you're like you're almost sort of semi sports psychologist come coach, aren't you? With where you sort of sit in every everything. I by the sounds of it. And it's the same stuff, you know. I'm just watching yeah. people in high pressure situations, and then reflect into them how they show up. So I watch my leaders give presentations to their teams 
and then we'll yeah. talk about you know how did they show up and how do and then how does the rest of the room react to how they show up yeah yeah and i bet that's a can be an uncomfortable conversation if they particularly think they're charismatic in the room it's like <laughs> you'd be amazed how many people aren't aware of that um i used to um try to keep this as vague as possible to not incriminate anyone <laughs> uh i i had a friend we used to do this work together and part of the work was it was a group of people giving presentations to a room and individually these people would give these presentations and you'd be amazed how often somebody would be in their presentation. It'd be about what we were doing the next day. And they'd gone past the information. And now they're just kind of sharing opinions and thoughts. And you watch the room. And, you know, for those that are listening to this and not seeing our video, you know, people are looking around and they're bored. And that person has lost the audience and they're just continuing. Yeah. And it's like the evidence is there. People are showing you whether they are paying attention or not. And presenting is a is a skill. And you mm. know, another part of presenting is demanding that the audience listen to you. You know, you stop, you pick people out, you converse with people in the audience to check that they're understanding what you're talking about. Hey, Bob, what did you get from this? You know, uh, what time are we meant to be meeting tomorrow? Like, wh- what do you need to bring? And then people are going to pay attention to you. If you just keep talking, people will switch off pretty quickly. Yes. Yeah, and it's it's uh, it's interesting. Easy. Some of the early presentation talk is to kind of look in the room as if you're making eye contact with people, but you're not actually looking at them. But you say, imagine gets you so far down the race, and then it's like, damn it! Now I don't know if they're engaged in the talk or not. <laughs> so that that's a great example of what I see happening and where my work is different. So that is, that's that's a mindset, right? So yes. you go to do a presentation and they'll say things like, just imagine everybody naked. Or, you know, like, look out into the audience, but look above them so that you can't see people's face so you don't get nervous. Yes. Great. That, that makes you a terrible presenter. What that does do is short term helps you get over your nervousness to get on the stage. So it's a quick fix. But the problem is it's teaching you a bad technique. So it's very short-term thinking. It gets you on the stage, but it it makes you a poor presenter. What you want to do instead is learn how to deal with the actual emotions that are coming up for you, why you're getting emotional, what's, what's the process that's happening in your body, why it's completely normal for that process to be happening, you know, we're, we're literally getting to the point where we think we're going to die. People people experience the kind of flood of emotions of fear like they're about to get eaten by a tiger when they go on a stage to talk to people. Mm. Yeah. What's the worst thing that can happen? It's just not very good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to still wake up tomorrow and be, and be alive. Like it's yes. not going to physically <laughs> threaten you. But that's not how we perceive it. And it's better to work on that and help people understand that and then give them good tools in presenting. Because mm. I tell you now, if you look at the audience and they feel that connection, that's what very charismatic people do. They look yes. at the audience. They point at the audience. They react to the ums and ahs in the audience to pace their presentation. They pause when they need to because they hear some kind of reaction, whether it be questions or applause or whatever. And you need to be very present and having that kind of technique that you're talking about there, of like oh, looking over the audience or imagine everybody naked, whatever it is, that actually stops you from going on to be great. And that is a great example of our avoiding short-term discomfort instead of accepting short-term discomfort to get that long-term gain. You know, yes. So the short-term discomfort is, you know, I'm not going to eat that donut that I want to eat. So that in... A year's time, I look at the mirror and go, Jesus, I'm in great shape. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you've got to keep saying no to that donut repeatedly. And what we're great at as humans is going, oh, I'll just have one. But then you get to the end of the year, if you tallied it up, now you've had 500 donuts and it's not just one. And now it's, you know, 10,000 calories and that's three pounds of body fat. And oh, look, I'm three pounds heavier this year than I was last year. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. So delaying gratification and getting comfortable with short-term discomfort, best things that human beings can do. And we should all be looking for ways to practice that. Yeah. It's a really tough one to do, isn't it? Because we're also evolved to 
jump in with a quick gratification because when we were running around banging sticks together, that worked brilliantly. So it's kind of... We haven't... Evolution has not caught up with the pace of human societal change. No, not at all. Um, you know, and... And scarily, that's just going to keep increasing, you know, as we move into, um, you know, more automated and AI systems, it's going to be a real challenge for humanity. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 It's, it's going to be, isn't it? I think actually, I think what you're talking about, your techniques dealing with our internal emotions and stuff rather than throwing band-aids or sticky plasters or whatever you want to do, depending which side of the Atlantic you're on on it because like for example when you were talking about presentation techniques one of the things i used to do to get over the nerves was practice the speech by drinking a load of coffee which don't drink caffeinated coffee anymore or running on the spot and then practicing it so it simulated all the elevated heart rate but it's just me covering the fact that <laughs> i was nervous while going on stage um i actually think there's some usefulness in that so i don't want to mm. diss down that i think preparing for the environment you're going to be in is actually really useful Mm. so you know if you're going to go compete at an olympics in a really hot country you better do some preparation of training in really yeah. hot conditions yeah. so i think getting yourself used to your environment very useful understanding why you're going to be facing that environment what is creating that and that you will be okay and getting comfortable with that is then the next level from that and it's one of the things I used to see in sports psychology, and I see it changing a lot, a lot now, luckily, but kind of the beginnings of sports psychology was a lot of Band-Aid fixes. It's like, right, let's do some breathing exercises on the day to calm you down, rather than what can we be doing in training for months to get you prepared for this? Can yeah. we be playing simulated crowd noises? Um, you know, Can we take you to the venue that you're going to be going to to do your big competition so you can get used to the venue as often as possible? Yeah. You, know, you want to be making everything feel like just another day. Yeah. And yeah. the other thing is to give people the trust that they will be okay, whatever happens. And the only way you can do that is to keep pushing people's resilience levels. You have to challenge people. The mm. more you challenge people and put them in situations that are difficult for them, the more resilient they become, the more self-trust they have. And this is where we've really failed a generation of young humans because we've done the opposite. You know, I'm sure you had to, I had to get myself to school. Yeah. You know, I started riding my bike to school when I was like 10 or something and walking yeah. to school around that same kind of age. Yeah, catching And then I was bus. getting a bus to school. Yeah. And now we drive kids to school because yeah. we're worried about them being abducted or something happening to them. Yet yeah. statistically, these are infinitesimally small instances. But because of... Uh, an over-exaggerated concern, we've now created people that are not resilient. So then they go into the workplace. And, yeah, we have instances. I've had companies where parents have called the owners of companies to, to complain about their adult child and oh. how, yeah, and, and, you know, like, oh, my adult child doesn't get enough holiday. And they're ringing up to talk about a 25-year-old. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. Just me and you, you just can't imagine that. And like, this is the embarrassment. Like, I'd, I'd be more be livid if my mum <laughs> ran up and said, like, What the hell are you doing, mum? Yeah. But, well. <laughs> but this is what we've created. And, you know, I think it's starting to change as we understand human psychology more. There is nothing wrong with stress and pressure, there's nothing wrong with putting people in difficult situations. Yeah. What yeah. we don't want is just continued situations. Yeah. You know, stress itself is very good. Your body is built and ready to adapt to stress, and we should be continually stressing ourselves. Yeah, it's no different to training in that respect, is it? Yeah. The dose yeah. makes the poison, doesn't it? If you're if you're training constantly five days a week for three hours in a row each day, you're probably going to overdo it and the body will shut down. And it's the same with being exposed to stresses, isn't it? Yeah. And and it's not usually the stress. That's the biggest issue is, is how we deal with it. Like yes. What are you actually doing? You know, how do you, what's your relief to the stress? What's your process for becoming de-stressed yeah. so that you can then get back up and do it again? And then again and again and again. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah, and it, it is. And I think there's a lot, there's a lot, as you say, it's starting to shift. I think there's a lot of information out there. People are starting to realize how you de-stress, how you unplug from your devices, how how 
you know, how interesting that Eastern medicine is now sliding into Western medicine and things like that to kind of get the the great ape to do what it needs to do and work the way it wants to work. <laughs> well, you know, we also make it very complicated oh, when it's usually pretty easy. Yeah. So get great sleep. Well, getting great sleep is pretty simple. Get up, get yourself outside in sunlight at the same time every day so your body gets used to a good schedule. Go to bed at the same time every day. Make sure that's early enough so that you can get decent sleep. Avoid bright lights as your body is winding down. So don't look at your screens as your body is winding down. You'll get good sleep. Mm. That is like the basic fundamental for human beings. If there's one thing I could give people is sleep better. If you yeah. sleep better, everything comes better. And we were talking about it before yeah. we started the show. How badly my dyslexia or you know, how much worse my dyslexia is when I haven't had good sleep. You know, I've been traveling, time zone changes. In the last two months, I've been to the UK, Cyprus, Japan, Vegas, then the East Coast. Uh, and it's all these different few. time zone changes. Yeah. I'm tired. And my brain doesn't work as well. And no. for somebody who's neurodivergent, when your brain doesn't work as well, there's an obvious effect to that. You yeah. know, there's times I can barely speak. I just can't form a sentence correctly yeah. and try to write something down. <laughs> yeah. Forget yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. Why can, Why is my hand not operating this pen the way I expect it to? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, sleep, eating well. People focus a lot on, like, you know, not eating rubbish. I always think, do the opposite. Focus on eating really good stuff. If you eat some rubbish on top of that, so what? You know, if you have some confectionery on, if you get your basic needs met, all that's likely to happen then is you're going to gain weight. But it's not going to have as much of an adverse health effect yes. than if you just, you know, just eat good nutrients first. Start with that and make sure that you are always eating good nutrients first. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It's funny, isn't it? You know, it? I see a lot of these programs and 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 a podcast and they're, they're talking about kind of changing the top 1%. When you're not sleeping well first, right? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter how many ice baths and whatever you do if you are only working on three hours sleep a night. Like it's just... Yeah. So some of these things have minimal gains. And if you've optimized everything else, absolutely do these things. Yeah. But I'd see this with, especially with master's athletes, not so much with, with elite athletes, but with master's athletes, the typical one would be they'd be 40 pounds overweight. And then they're saying to me, you know, you know, should I do single leg squats, coach? Or, you know, like, <laughs> how should I grip this weight? And, like, should I do five sets or four sets? I'm like, lose 40 pounds and you're going to go faster. Like, that should be priority number one over yes. everything else. Yeah. yeah. Lose that. Yeah. You know, we've got a sport here where weight makes a difference. Yeah. Acceleration. Yeah. Lose the weight and you're going to go faster. So everything should be prioritized in the biggest gain first. Yeah, force equals mass times acceleration. <laughs> Yeah, but guess what? That's the that's the that's that short term discomfort that people don't want to do for the longer term gain. They'd yeah. rather get all fancy about their kit and get in the right skin suit that's going to make you know half a tenth of a second difference in the two hundred <laughs> meter event, instead of let me lose forty pounds and that's half a second's difference. So yeah. it's ten times the gain. Yeah, and yeah. guess what? It's free. Uh, well, yeah. Well, actually. It probably saves you some money because donuts aren't the cheapest <laughs> thing in the world sometimes, are they? <laughs> not, not just free, your bank balance gets bigger. <laughs> I just want to be very clear at this moment in time, I have nothing against donuts. <laughs> I like donuts quite a lot myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, this I, is not an anti-donut podcast. This is not, no, definitely not. Donuts are great. <laughs> along, along, along with lots of other sweet things that have to eat in moderation. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you've got time, we can have a, just a quick little fun thing on that. On, the man. difference between uh, moderators and abstainers. So yes. some people can moderate and some people can't. Um, and, and this is, you know, this is really all, all I want people to take from today is understand yourself. Mm. So get the support you need to understand yourself. You want your life to change. The more you understand about you, the more impactful, effective, fulfilled happiness you're going to experience in your life it really is that simple so i am not a moderator okay yeah actually let me let me be more specific it depends on what it is mm. i can easily moderate alcohol never been that interested in drinking a lot don't like being drunk 
will enjoy a fruity cocktail or a nice whiskey very occasionally, yeah. one and done. So yeah. I don't have a problem with that. However, confectionery, especially very sweet confectionery, no limit to my consumption abilities. If it's there, I'm going to eat it. Ah, okay. So I have to abstain. So that means I don't have it in the house. Because I have it in the house. If I had five chocolate bars here, two would be gone by the end of the day, maybe three. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't yeah. matter how big they were. I just, on I can't. And people talk about willpower like it's this year. I have lots of willpower. Willpower is a bit irrelevant. What you want to be working on is good processes. Yes. So you yeah. want to make doing what you want to be as frictionless as possible. Mm. So if you don't want to eat a bunch of confection, right, don't have it in your house because then it's more friction to go out and get it than it is just to sit here and have an apple and peanut butter. Yes. So have healthy snacks in abundance and make the, you know, the snacks that you don't want to have difficult to get and then make some rules. You know, humans are pretty good at following rules. So if you say, I'll only eat confectionery on a Saturday, it's much easier to do that. If you say, I'm going to moderate my confectionery intake and you go out with a friend and it's a Wednesday night and they said, you want dessert? And you go, yeah, sure, it's only one dessert. And then I won't have any the rest of the day. Then you go with another friend on Friday and they said, do you want dessert? And you're like, oh, God, it's only one more. Mm. Whereas if your rule is, I only eat confectionery or desserts on Saturday, then when your friend asks on Wednesday, you're like, oh, no, my rule is I don't eat desserts on a, on a Wednesday. Yeah. It's already made up for you. It, it's so thinking, what are the rules that I want to have in my life that support me? Yeah. Makes sense. That's really interesting. When you were saying about the moderators and abstainers, I thought that was going to be a personality trait. But your example of actually that one thing you're an abstainer and one thing you're a moderator is, I guess it's trying to pit, trying to understand the theme of this podcast, really, your own personal interaction with that. Like, yeah, I mean, I can, I could do sort of 24, 36 hour fast, no problem. <laughs> but can't not leave the chocolate bars alone. <laughs> See, I can't fast. Yeah. I, it doesn't work for me. I've tried it and everyone's like, yeah, do a fast and you'd be more mentally uh, alert. I was going to fast this morning and then I was already feeling groggy. Oh, I could eat. I, I run on a lot of carbs, yeah. which is why I like eating a lot of sweets. <laughs> uh, I can also just eat really decent carbs. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. A lot more, lot better energy <laughs> than sweets. But yeah, sweets are so good. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the other thing. You know, I, I, I created some rules about it because I noticed that when I get in, and you know, this is get back into human psychology. Yeah. yeah. Above and below the line. So the below the line, that reactive, emotional, instinctual state. We'll talk ourselves into doing anything. Oh, so yes. I have a craving for sugar. I will go and eat any sugar. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, Whereas above the line, my cognitive state is like, why am I eating this crap? I don't even like it. You know, how I don't know how often you've done this, but I have certainly taken a bite of something and thought, I don't even really like this. I'm just eating it because it's sugar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. And then I keep eating yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And then yeah. I keep eating it yeah, instead of. Right, I will allow myself to have some things that bring me this short-term pleasure. I, I don't think we should completely get you know get rid of all of that. I know there's some people that do that. Um, I don't, I'm not personally. I think there should be some of it, but why not make it really good chocolate that I'm going to really enjoy, mm. or really good ice cream that I'm going to really enjoy, and then have a rule where I'm going to have one scoop, and then that's it. It's done. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes sense. And I think, yeah, I've certainly been guilty of that. Just eating away. Like, what am I doing? Why am I even eating this? I don't want it. It's just there. <laughs> no, that's uh, that's really cool. And I think that's a good place to kind of leave this podcast, I think. Is there, um, obviously, you've got your own company. So whether you'd like to share where people can find you and what your own companies are, would be great. I know it's pay for your performance now, but the last time it was... No, um, I, my rebranding is continuing. So yeah, it's just going to be Leap Hovey. So just Google me, Leap Hovey, and you will find me. Um, website should be done in a couple of months. Um, I, you know, we talk about these things. I've been for a real process of discovery. What is it I want to do? I want to support the smartest people possible in creating the most impact possible. That's it. So whatever that looks like, founders, startups, I want to. I want to change the lives of at least 100 million people. Wow. And I can't do that by myself. No, I'm not a politician. 
Um, I'm not Tony Robbins. That's not really my stick. <laughs> so um, I need to do this via other people by empowering them and supporting them, coaching them and mentoring them to be the best versions of themselves. Um, but yeah, you'll find me everywhere at Leap IV. So Facebook, Instagram, um, and a new website coming soon. Excellent. Well, I'll post links to all that down in the show notes. But of course, when these new websites online, have a quick Google and hopefully it will pop up. But I want to thank you once again for jumping on the podcast and discussing more, a lot more human factors and coaching this time around. And I think it all dovetails really nicely into the previous episode with how your own personal story and self-discovery come in. So again, thank you for spending the time with me this evening. My pleasure, Matthew. Great to see you again, buddy. Thank you. Uh, And as always, I want to thank everybody else for taking time to listen and I'll speak to you in the next episode. Goodbye for now. Mm -hmm.